start with and then we will start working our way through some material is I want you to take the markers and I want you to take the piece of paper. This might be outside of some of your comfort zone. Some of you might say, finally, I get to express myself artistically. All right. But what I want you to do, just take a minute or two because we don't have a lot of time. But what I want you to do is I want you to jot down, write down. You can even depict it through a drawing if you prefer that. All right. But what are two things you hope to learn today or to gain from this seminar? All right. So two things you hope to gain from this seminar. It might be as simple as I just want some strategies because my class, it's hard to do this collaborative learning thing. It might be, I think I'm already doing this. I just want to hone these skills. You may just draw a picture of you doing something creative because you want more creativity in your class in terms of what you do with collaborative work. So two things that you hope to uh, get from this seminar today. Let's come back together. This little exercise that we just did was an example of collaborative learning. As simple as it was, it's called think, pair, share, right? And we oftentimes feel very turned off by maybe doing something like this because we think, oh, we're wasting students' time. Like, what are they going to contribute to this? Or we might say, we just have this, we need to deliver this lecture to them. But what I've found is when you set that expectation from the beginning that you're going to use lots of different teaching styles and methods in your class, then they don't think you're wasting class time and doing this type of things. And you see how quick this think pair share was, right? It's going to take, I mean, a minute or two. Sometimes I do this at the beginning of lecture and say, what are two things you want to get out of this lecture today, right? Now talk to the person beside you. Do y'all want to get the same things out of this? Or do you have totally different goals? And I might even throw in there, how do you hope to apply this lecture to your career? Because when you can apply and have a direct application for students, I've found that particularly with this generation, they love to know what they can do with the material that you're giving them, how it can apply directly to their context and what they're doing. And so this think uh, or uh, the think and share little thing that we just did, think, pair, share, um, is a nice one, quick, just gets it done. And I heard some good conversations with y'all just kind of thinking through. And when you're able to bounce your ideas off someone, I think you can flesh those out and say, oh, okay, yeah, I like that perspective that you shared with me. Now, this doesn't mean every student is going to love this type of activity, but I think if you appeal to a lot of learning styles, and I'll share with you more examples, I think it's important. But what I have found is the most important thing with doing good collaborative learning is to set that expectation from the very beginning. The first day of class, we do collaborative learning. Um, you know, I want them discussing. I want them talking to each other. So very first class, we don't go to the syllabus. We don't do that. I have them sit down, fill out a little sheet of paper about how they define a term we're going to do in that class. And then I say, share it with the person beside you. How did that enhance, you know, your learning? Now, what we could do is then open it up to the group and say, okay, I want to hear from each group so that then they formally present that. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. For the sake of time, I'm going to skip that. On some topics, it's really good to do that. Uh, so when we think about collaborative learning, you've got lots of handouts in front of you, and I'll allude to some of these as we go through. But when we think about what collaborative learning is, it's really learning that returns responsibility to the student. All right. Now, I think when we think about collaborative learning, we always think, oh, it's group work, right? It is, we have to do group work, and students hate group work, and probably all of us in the room were the ones who did all of the group work, right? When we were in a group, we were the ones who were left with that. But there are strategic ways to do that, and collaborative learning isn't just group work. It returns responsibility to the student in a simple way like this, or it's something where, I mean, you're learning together. And something that I have been passionate about in recent years is really developing and empowering what I call the student expert. They are here to learn from us. And there is not a lack of lecture and that type of stuff in my courses, all right? But empowering them and saying, well, what do you know about this topic and what do you have to contribute here? And an example of this is what I've done in my community psychology class. Um, I'm in psychology, which does lend itself to very practical things. But I would argue all of us can be and think creatively and practically about these things. But with community psychology, they do a project in the community. It's teaching them how to work in nonprofit settings, realizing that psychology is not just being a therapist or you know doing those things. And so they're responsible for a Boys and Girls Club project. From the ground up, they plan a special event. I mean, from going over there to the Boys and Girls Club to interviewing the director to say, what do you need? What can we help you with? 
to forming committees and doing those different <coughs> things. And in the beginning of the semester, the students have a little bit of anxiety about, I'm going to plan a project and I have no experience with this. And I'm like, well, that's the beauty of school. I'm supervising, right? You're not, on, you're not dangling out on your own here. You've got me here to help you through this. And while I handle a lot of the organizational stuff, they feel really empowered that I have something to contribute, right? And what they're doing is taking course content. So I teach them how to do a needs assessment, then we go do that, right? With me sitting there to, you know, if it gets derailed, I can intervene and help out, okay? But then me giving them time in class to say, okay, you're the committee that's gonna handle the fundraising for our project. What does that mean? How do we gain expertise in this? And so being able to directly apply it, it's opened up a lot of opportunities for them for jobs for feeling competent, to put on their resume to say, I've actually done something, you know, uh, instead of just sit and learn uh, different things, I've applied it. And then I also love this idea of active learning. How can we make things come alive for students? This can be as simple, again, as what we just did, but if you can't get out and do a project, I think also uh, uh, thinking through how can you do a case study? How can you do uh, a different applies? I just did something the other day. I tested it out for the first time. I need to ask my students what they thought. They seemed to like it, but I need to really kind of get some process on this. But we were talking about in my capstone class, we were talking about defining soul, mind, body, all of these different terms that are very theological, but very psychological. And so what I did is I assigned each group a different piece of literature to read. So one group, they just read scripture on that. And they went and I said, define those terms based on scripture. So they went off. I said, go get coffee, go sit outside. I don't care what you do, but answer these questions for me. You've got 20 minutes. Then I gave another group a commentary on the scripture so that they could actually look and say, oh, well, maybe I've been misinterpreting that because I'm just, you know, what my pastor told me is what I've always believed. And so let me kind of dig into this myself. I gave another group a neuropsychology article on neuropsychologist and soul and how they're trying to pinpoint where the soul is. And then I gave another group a psychology, kind of an integration of faith and psychology article. They all came back together and we just filled the board with, okay, what does this source say soul is? What does this source say mind? What does this source say, you know, or all these different things. And it was so cool to see them all work together and it proved my whole point of there are multiple perspectives and we often don't go back to sources, right? We just define what we think we know or what our mom and dad told us. And it presented this beautiful picture of complex terms. And also too, I think we had more questions than we had answers, but we collaborated together and we're like, I think the consensus, like we were like, this is hard. <laughs> we can't leave here knowing exactly what these terms mean, but man, we're more informed for this. And so that's just an example of, you know, a collaborative learning exercise. It's something where I encourage you to be creative. And here's the thing, it, don't be afraid if it flops, right? I have had probably more failures than I've had successes, but when I find something that works, you better believe I'm gonna try it in all my classes, you know, and try to do these things. You just got to not be afraid to put yourself out there. Another piece of thing, or, or another thing that I have found very helpful is to just try to encourage that creativity. We didn't need to use markers today to do this, but it changes your mindset, doesn't it? you think, oh, I'm doing something that's fun. Oh, I can draw, I can engage my right brain. I can do some of these things. And so I'll often have students just kind of do a fun way of let's create class goals. Let's share that with one another. I'll even have students sometimes draw an image of what a certain thing looks like them. Like if we're doing personality theory, I might say, close your eyes for a moment draw an image that represents personality to you because then we tap into some richer definitions of those things. And you don't need a degree in arts therapy to be able to do that. It just helps students open up, right? And they could even share and say like, okay, to their friend, my drawing's hideous, ignore that. Don't judge me for my drawing, but this helps me realize that when I think about personality, I think about these things and just a word definition may not have um, brought that up for me. So, yes, absolutely. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> close your eyes and imagine the image and then open them to okay. draw. So yes, some of them look like they have closed their eyes to draw, but yes, <laughs> absolutely. Now, when we think about setting a firm foundation for collaborative learning, I, I don't think collaborative learning works unless you have set that expectation from the outset in your class. Like I mentioned before, the first day of class, the things that are foundational to my class, I go ahead and do those things. So I always open with a simple collaborative uh, uh, learning exercise. When students walk in my classroom, doesn't matter what class it is, I have a little slip of paper they fill out. They put their name, their email, what year they are, whatever. And then I have them define a term. 
that's you know central to the class. So for Capstone, for example, we talk a lot about integration of theology and psychology. And so I have them define those terms. What's theology? What's psychology? So they do it. They turn to each other. They share those definitions. Then we create together, okay, what's our working definition for the class for these two terms? Because we're going to keep coming back uh, to these things. So from day one, I have set the tone that that is what I'm going to do. And for me, that's always been important because when I look at my teaching evaluations, for example, on do I use class time effectively, as much collaborative learning as I do, you might think I'd take a hit on that because students want to just learn, learn, learn. Mine are always really, really high when it comes to using class time effectively. And I think it's because I make that known from the outset, right? I'm very explicit about it. Something I've learned from the what I've learned from the beginning of teaching is to label what we're doing. Sometimes if we just do something, students do not pick up on that, do they? And I'm like, why would they not? But I, I still I just label it explicitly and say, like, right now we're gonna collaborate. This is important. I've even told them, research tells us that you will remember this material if you collaborate with your partner. All right. And I'll tell them, I'm gonna do what works in the classroom, whether you like it or not. And so here we go, you know, on this journey together. And so making that very explicit from the outset. If you look at this handout that I've given you, these are just a couple of things. I actually compiled this recently when I gave a presentation in my department on how to use class time effectively. But I think collaborative <coughs> learning and how to use class time effectively, I, I think those are really strongly related. Um, because collaborative learning can be done well, but it can also be done and perceived as a waste of time with students. And so we have to be intentional about that. So with you, when you look uh, at these steps, I'll just kind of uh, mention them briefly. But one is set expectations early in the semester. All right, you want discussion, you want collaborative learning, do it the first day, do it the first week. Something I've found really helpful because often when you do collaborative learning, you may leave with more questions than answers. The students may say, I've researched this and like I don't have that you know, black or white answer that I was looking for on a topic. Label the disorganization that occurs when we do put our heads together, right? Sometimes it feels fragmented. Sometimes we've got to come back the next class period and we've got to dig deeper, all right? Sometimes I've got to go with an issue that arose during collaborative learning and do another lecture on that, right, to clarify some things. And so label it when it happens. Say, okay, I, I notice you're feeling confused. I notice this might have created more questions than answers. That's okay. And you label that process for them because I think where students perceive that things aren't helpful is when we're not helping narrate that process for them. I think that's important. Um, provide a roadmap for the course. Anytime I'm providing a roadmap or even in my syllabus, in a lot of my classes I will have certain days where I'll call it application Friday. Um, I tried to come up with something clever and I just couldn't, so we just call it application Friday, all right. Um, and so with those application days, they know to come in and expect not your typical lecture, all right, and for there to be more intentional collaborative learning. Now, I'm always doing little things throughout lecture, you know, to, to make it creative for them. But on Fridays, they get a case study. They get, um, you know, a guest speaker and they have to come prepared with questions or they work in groups, right? Another example of collaborative learning, come up with five questions as a group that you really want answered, you know, by this expert who's coming in. And so they know to expect that. An example of something we did recently on an application Friday is we were talking, it was capstone again, this was just really geared towards some of these case study things for, for us in psychology. We were talking about free will and Psychology has a lot to say about determinism versus free will. The theorists are all over the map. Same with theology, right? There's a lot of different theologians and perspectives on free will versus determinism and those type of things. So we took a case study of a young woman who had uh, schizophrenia and who ended up killing someone when she was untreated. This woman tried to get help. She tried, 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 told people, hospitalize me, I am not well. But the system just really failed this woman and she ended up killing this innocent uh, girl. So what I did is I broke up pieces of information about this person who was mentally ill and gave it to each group in there. And based on that, they had to discuss how responsible, morally responsible is someone who is this mentally ill for their actions, right? And so that perpetuated for us a discussion about, and, and I didn't prescribe what this answer needs to be, but it perpetuated a rich discussion that they had to talk to each other about, right? And they were arguing within their groups, you know, coming to some type of, what are we gonna say to the class? 
I mean, it was a bit controversial, but in the end, it was just really cool to see multiple perspectives represented there. And they loved that application. Um, and none of them would say that that was a time waster. It helps them apply things that they're really passionate about in the field of psychology. Um, you'll also see um, Summarize. This is something um, that uh, I have to thank Jeff Sargent, who's here, my department chair. Every time he would come and evaluate me in my classes, he's like, great lecture, awesome collaborative learning. Summarize what you've just done, you know, including the collaborative learning. And I'm like, you're right, because I'm the type who I'm like trying to vomit as much as I can. Like, I have to teach you everything today, you know, that I know. And so I've slowed myself down. And this has made a huge difference, too, in students' takeaway from the class. I have a like summary slide, right? Okay, sometimes I do that. Sometimes what I do is I have them jot down on a sheet of paper two things you learned from lecture today, right? And so they'll jot it down and sometimes I have it turn it in. So I really wanna see what they're taking away, right? You know, are you taking away what I want you to or not? But my favorite one is to have them turn to the person beside them and say, tell your friend or the neighbor sitting beside you, what are two things you learned today? And how do you hope to apply it? And so that one, they really seem to like that and it congeals and consolidates that experience for them. And I imagine many of you are already doing a lot of these strategies, you just didn't know you were doing it. But if you know you're doing it, this is a great goal um, to put in your PAC and those type of things that you're engaging in collaborative learning because it's high impact learning and research tells us that it is one of the most effective ways to teach students, um, particularly this generation. So that segues us into some of the benefits of collaborative learning. Promotes active learning, I think you can see that. Something I like about it too is it teaches real life skills. When students leave us and they go into the real world, whether it's ministry, whether it's nursing, whether it's communications, whatever they're doing, they are most likely not going to be working in isolation. They are going to be working on teams. They are going to have to learn how to collaborate effectively. And so this is actually sets them up to learn some of that skill set early. Now, with that said, I always give the caveat, particularly for group work, if you have an issue with a group member, if your experience is being significantly hindered, please come and talk to me. You will not be penalized for that. I even have group members rate each other. I say, you know, part of your grade is rating each other on how much you've shown up, how much you've contributed. Because I don't want collaborative learning to turn into someone feeling like, well, I just have to do the work and what's supposed to be active learning being kind of a passive experience, okay? And so I do give them opportunities to function as a professional, give feedback, talk to me. And I have had to step in before and pull students aside and say, listen, there's some things that you've got to do better on this group work um, because it's important that you contribute equally. And um, I, I think we just have to be able to, you know, hit some of that head on. Uh, something else I like too about uh, collaborative learning is it increases a sense of competence and productivity, right? I almost use the word self-esteem. I'm like, oh, that's such a buzzword, right? And some of our students do not need higher self-esteem, right? They already <laughs> think they are like on top of the world, okay? But I think when they get an increased sense of self-efficacy, like my professor gave me a task to do and I'm able to complete it. I'm thinking, uh, for example, of um, uh, the course that I had them develop curriculum, trauma curriculum for Liberia. Now trauma is my area of expertise and so I definitely had my hand in this so much because you can do harm if you don't do trauma stuff right, okay. And so what I did, uh, uh, with them is I told them I said we've got a project in here and you're going to be developing some trauma curriculum for post Ebola Liberia you know this traumatized community the orphanage needs some materials now I got them started gave them information in class taught them how to do this but at the beginning students thought we're we're not experts in this and I'm like well how do you think I became an expert in this through practice through teaching through doing these things and it was amazing by the end of the semester they thought we are definitely not like perfect experts in this, but they felt this sense of, we know so much about trauma now and we're excited about it. This group of students even raised their own money to go deliver this themselves in Liberia um, because they were so passionate about reaching this population, right? And so I trained them, I didn't even go with them, sent them on their way and they did amazing. Now, one was an undergrad who just graduated and then one, uh, two were graduate students. So that level of work is more tailored to a graduate student. But the undergrads are also accomplishing this task at the Boys and Girls Club 
where they're like, how do I plan a community service? Or how do I plan, you know, this so that the kids actually get something out of it? And at the end of the semester, I have them reflect back and they say, like, my sense of professional identity, right? Like, I can do this. I didn't know I was capable of creating something like this, but I did it. And I think that's so important. And I think we often forget in college to connect what we're doing to professional identity, right? Because I tell my students, I'm like, instead of saying you're going to be, be, be this, you are this right now and let's you know learn together. And I also think that collaborative learning can provide a voice for more hesitant class participants, right? I have some of my students who'd be happy to never speak up. They're good students, but they'd be happy to sit on the back row, take great notes, ace my class, but this forces them, okay, and it may be uncomfortable. And I have some who are like, oh, I know I'm gonna be in your class, so I'm gonna have to, you know, talk to the person beside me and do group work. But I think that having them be able to also speak up, students who aren't as comfortable in a huge setting, you know, speaking up, but are more comfortable sharing their ideas um, with a person uh, beside them. Um, but also, people who tend to be more reserved, having them write down their stuff first and to have a little script also helps them, doesn't it? All right. I'm as extroverted as they come. So this idea of, you know, not wanting to talk to everybody, I'm like, what? Don't you just want to talk to the world? But a lot of my students are introverted and they need time to process those ideas before they share them, right? And so having written it down and then showing the person beside them allows them to participate, but also feel safe in that context. And a lot of what I'm talking about also comes back to this idea of set those expectations early but also create safety in the classroom so that this can um, uh, take place and take place effectively. All right, so what I want you to do now is I want you to compare notes to the person beside you. See what they've jotted down. Have you missed anything? Do you need to fill out your notes a little more? See if you need to compare. Maybe you tell the person beside you one thing that you've learned so far, all right, and compare notes on that. All right, so let's come back together. So this little exercise was called catch up. All right, some of you may already do this, but I do this um, on a regular basis where I'll just kind of pause. I'll have students kind of compare notes. Did you miss something? What'd you learn so far? Okay, let's get back on track, okay? I'll do this one intentionally because it does help students retain and apply what they're doing in the moment. But also if I see them looking drowsy or I see them kind of, you know, whatever, I'll also do this just to kind of wake them up, get them moving again. But this is one of the um, collaborative learning strategies that works and it's very simple, right? It's something that students aren't going to say, well, you're not using your class time effectively. Yes, you are. You're getting them to think and review and do this in a creative way. Now, as far as the handouts in front of you, I have printed off several things. There's no way we're going to work our way um, through all of this. And I also want to hear from y'all, what are you doing um, in the class? I want to be collaborative in this presentation. But um, if you look at the first handout, this is from Cornell's um, Center for Teaching Excellence. They've compiled quite a bit of research on what is collaborative learning and then also some strategies for effective group work, including a rubric. Uh, if you're like me, the more structure you put around the group work, the better it's going to be just because then students feel like it's managed well, right? It's so funny because I can orally tell a student something and if I put it in the form of just like even the simplest little strip of paper handout, for some reason that just makes all the difference. Like, oh, here it is versus, okay, I just wrote this on the board, okay? But um, I do that because that helps students have some structure and boundaries around it. If you skip to this collaborative learning, it's after the um, first uh, thing that I gave y'all, the little sheet that I made. If you skip through uh, to the second page on that, it says, what are some examples of collaborative learning or group work activities? We've done two of these. We just did catch up. And then we also did the think, pair, share, write, pair, share, uh, little exercise, simple to do. But you'll also see the first one is stump your partner. This one's fun. Uh, for students. They take a minute to create a challenging question based on the lecture content up to that point. Students pose the question to the person sitting next to them. You can also take it a step further and have them turn their questions in and those questions could be used to create tests or exams. I usually don't take it that far but I will have them quiz each other, you know, do that type of thing to try to stump their partner. 
You'll also see down the fourth one is called a fishbowl debate. This can be really effective. I don't tend to use this one, but I've had colleagues that do and it works well. Ask students to sit in groups of three, assign roles. For example, the person on the left takes one position, person on the right takes the opposite, and the person in the middle takes notes, okay? And decides which side is the most convincing and provides an argument for his or her choice. Debrief by calling on a few groups to summarize their questions. I want to highlight what I think is more important than this fishbowl technique itself is the debriefing piece. Collaborative work can fall apart if you don't appropriately process it, okay? And I'm not talking process it like a psychologist because I like to process everything, right? Over process it, okay? But I'm saying make sure you debrief and at least have some conclusions and summaries that you draw. The other day when I was doing that whole soul and mind and body thing where I had different groups assigned to, you know, different readings that they went and did, I, I, first time I did it, I didn't have enough time to process it. But instead of just saying, okay, we don't have enough time, I told them, I said, number one, we'll come back to this later, but we did draw a couple of conclusions, right? We labeled the process, even though we didn't have, you know, strong content at that point to deal with. You've just got to debrief them. And one thing that's always a good idea when you're doing this type of high impact learning is start with the question, what was this experience like for you, right? Because the process is often just as important as the content and the things that you're doing. So I'll often ask students, okay, real fast, we got a minute, what was this like for you? And some students will say, ah, this was just, I, I don't love group work, but I see the value, right? Another might say, I loved this because I was actually getting to problem solve rather than just having to sit and take notes today. And so asking them, right? And if it's a huge class, you may just have them jot down a piece of paper, rate this little exercise from one to five. What was that like for you? So that then you get some feedback from the class. You'll also see the last uh, piece on what are uh, examples of collaborative learning, case study. Now I think in all of our fields, we can do a case study, right? And I've had colleagues who I've helped do this and they feel like their case study has to be just this wonderful, amazing, perfect case study. You know what I do oftentimes? I'll kind of get an idea in my head of an example I want them to learn. I may jot down a couple notes. I just give it to them orally. And I'm like, get out your pens, get out your paper, jot down what I've got to say because here's your case study. And they, there's almost this sense of urgency of like, oh, I've got to write down what she says so I can solve this problem, you know. And so, I mean, you can put as much time and energy into that or you can make it a simple five minute, here's a real life application, right? Um, again, psychology leans it, uh, itself towards having a lot of case examples, you know, and I've done a lot of clinical work and have examples myself, but I think of all of your fields and what is our end goal for them as professionals, right? Mm -hmm. How can we, I think of math, for example, giving them, a lot of them want to be math teachers, right, in high school, giving them an example and saying a student comes to you is completely lost on how to do this basic algebra. They're crying, they're upset. What do you do? Number one, how do you relationally handle it? But number two, how do you think through what their learning style is and teach them how to do, you know, a little quick review in math? I think all of this we can think through what a case study might look like. You'll also see on the next page, team-based learning, and then there's tons of more suggestions on the team-based learning. When you just scroll through this little handout, what happens uh, is the authors go into just more detail on how to do groups effectively. We don't have time to go through all of this, but the next handout you'll see is having student work in groups, five ways to get the results you want, um, some research on this, all right, and just some practical strategies. Always have a chairperson, give them a specific task, but also process the content and um, just the group process as well. Keep skipping through. This is just stuff for you to have. It's a chess checklist for discussing things that are important to your group. And then you'll also see a rubric. Um, it was developed from Crow and colleagues, uh, just kind of the assessment of the group, some examples of that if you wanted to adapt this for any group work that you're doing. All right. And then the final piece is classroom structures, which encourage student participation. All right. So group discussion, buzz groups, panel discussions can be really nice. Pulling in a panel of experts, but having students prepare questions ahead of time, right? So that they are not just collaborating with classmates, but also experts in the field. I'm actually doing a panel today in my capstone class on grad school. Most of my students are like, ah, what do we do next, right? And so I've helped them think through that, but then they've come up for questions for the panel um, today that is like a faculty member, prior students, a grad student, you know, just things like that. Now, the final document you'll see in here that I want to draw your attention to 
It's called Building a Classroom Community. This is from uh, University of Utah, their Center for Teaching Excellence. They've done a lot of research and work um, as well. But I wanted to draw your attention to how do you develop this sense of community in a classroom, all right? Creating safety is really important. If you want an environment that's collaborative, students have to feel safe to do that. And so there's lots of ways to do that. I think welping, welcoming a diversity of opinions, right? We've all had to shut down the student who wants to dominate discussions, right? Figuring out how to do that diplomatically so that everyone feels heard. But also, I, I think having them work just in pairs, they typically sit by people they feel comfortable and safe with. So starting with that really small pairing can be a way to extend um, some of their openness to doing this in a, a broader setting. Um, so. You'll also see on the second page of this some more activities to give you some practical tips. But there's a little checklist. If you're thinking of implementing more collaborative learning, this checklist walks you through different uh, uh, things that you need to make sure incorporated to be effective, all right? So the first question, for example, is the activity highly structured? Students want to know who will they work with, who will go first, second, what will they use, how much time do they have as a group? What is the process? So just set good boundaries around it, right? So that it's clear to students. Do students know the rationale? This is again where we have to be explicit, right? If I just say, okay, everybody's gonna take these different articles and we're gonna talk about soul, mind, body. I had spent so much time building up to this, talking about the importance of multiple sources to inform our integration of faith and psychology, that they knew the rationale for this. So they were on board, you know, to be able to do this uh, constructively. What's expected of them by the teacher? How will learning activity affect motivation, um, et cetera, et cetera. But this just gives you some good guidelines so that you're very explicit um, with what you're doing, all right? So you can look through the rest of that, but I love just having a handful of practical strategies so you can go through these, highlight what you might wanna try. Research supports that this is um, uh, just one of the best ways to uh, empower students in the classroom and to have effective learning. I wanted to share a couple of examples and uh, then I've got a little worksheet for y'all to do in pairs, of course, um, so that we can talk about this. Uh, but what, uh, I've already gone through the think pair share. We've talked about structured group work. Group work gets messy when there's not a lot of structure and instruction around it, so remember that. Case studies and problem solving, we've talked through that. I've given you a couple of examples from uh, my courses, but uh, I wanted to just share a couple more because this might get some of your wheels turning or maybe you're doing some of the same things and we can share ideas. Uh, but there's another course I haven't mentioned. I teach a childhood disorders um, and intervention strategies course from time to time. And this is another class where these are students who they say, I want to be a school counselor. I want to be a you know, child psychologist. I want to do these things. And so what we've done is paired with a local school counselor and my students get to go in and observe and then write a behavior plan for the classroom that they observe. Now, is this behavior plan the end all be all for that classroom? No, the students think it is because they think this work is so significant, but it's more just a time for them to test it out. The stakes are actually low because I review these plans, I clean them up, you know, and students complete them. But it gives them that opportunity to partner up because they always do it with a partner and think through, how do I apply all this knowledge I have learned in psychology to think through this little naughty kid, what would I recommend, right, that the teacher do to help them? And so that's just another idea of kind of a creative way to do this, but it also combines uh, the value we have in service learning, right? If you can knock out, th that is always my strategy, kill about 20 birds with one stone, right? Because you really can be strategic and get a lot accomplished through one or two tasks. Another example is, um, uh, uh, what you mentioned uh, uh, when you introduced me, and it was the idea of doing student research groups. It's funny because when I was presenting this, uh, or pulling this together, I didn't even think about that as collaborative learning. Oh my gosh, it's one of the best examples of collaborative learning. Um, I have a student research team that I supervise, and so they are working together to produce good research. And I've tried my student research model multiple ways. I have tried it where I empower them to do their own projects um, and say, just let's do your own thing, I'll support it. That was way too much and just too crazy because they were going outside my area of expertise. 
And so what they do now is I run it much like a grad school lab and they do my research and I give them developmentally appropriate tasks. Um, so for example, I've got tons of data to code from Liberia because we gathered a lot of research when we did this manual to see if it's working. And so they're gonna code that, they're doing lit reviews and then we're gonna present it at a conference in uh, May. And so that's another great example of they collaborate together and then they, the process of seeing each piece they do pull together for the whole group to have a proposal or effective research um, has been a good experience for, for them to see it all come together. So those are just some examples. Um, and then for example, with the Boys and Girls Club project, um, what we're doing this year, and the students came up with this, uh, they're doing a career fair for the kids and each room is going to be a different type of career to empower the kids to um, have a sense of future orientation. And it was based off of um, what the director had said, that they love to promote, you know, career. They have a little tonight, or tomorrow night, they're actually, my students are going over to help them sign a college pledge, even the little kindergartners, that I'm going to go to college, I'm going to do these things. They're really trying to instill that sense. And it was so funny because I was leaning towards encouraging them to do something else, but my students said, no, Dr. Qualiana, we need our goals to align with the organization. We need it to be, you know, they are doing career on Thursday and we want to further this because we want to offer them our intellectual property. And I thought, oh, wow, that's amazing that they are taking what we're learning in class and saying, no, I want to do this right and I want to do this um, well. And so it can just be a really cool experience um, to do that and also get some of that service learning that they're passionate about. Thoughts or questions before I move? We've got probably about 10 minutes now to do your little worksheet, and then I want us all to come back together on this so I can hear from everybody. So, all right, this worksheet will give you the opportunity to share some of what you're already doing and what today's um, little talk got you thinking about, and then we'll come back together. But partner up, um, twos or threes, and I want you to answer these little uh, questions here. What we talk about, I think these questions help summarize everything we've talked about today. So this will serve as our summary and hitting those highlights that we did today. One thing I just remember that I failed to mention though is managing groups can be hard. These handouts are filled with examples. But one of the things that has helped me the most with managing groups, so for example in that community psychology class since they will be doing this whole project together, I actually give them a little survey about what are their strengths in uh, collaboration and some of those things. And then I assign each little group they have based on just kind of a diversity of strengths. So I'm not pairing all the good planners together, right? You know, because that committee, they'd plan something, but then the ones who were more creative would never get anything done, right? You know, but they'd sure be creative about it. And so I pair them so that there's multiple strengths in each group. If you want some little assessments and things that you could use to, to do that, just let me know. I'm happy to send those to you because there are very uh, structured ways that you can pair them so that they learn about complementary strengths versus, you know, um, it being just a real hassle to be in the group. So, Before yeah. you ask them to rate their strengths, or what mm -hmm. are you, mm -hmm. you're telling them, I need planners, I need, I need doers, I need I actually, you know, before, editors. before I have them do, I, I don't tell them, uh, the little thing I give them is particular to collaboration and consultation because it's a community site class. And so I just say, just write this stuff. Just check it off. I don't tell them I'm going to have a group for this, this, and this. I have them do it. Then I have them. All the different aspects yeah. of it. And they check it off. They just check it off and then objectively say, oh, okay, what were my top two areas? And then when I see what their strengths are and they reflect on that, I can find, you know, multiple strengths to each group. All right, so number one, what collaborative learning strategies are you, are you already doing in your class? Who wants to tell us that? What strategies are you already doing? Yeah. Um, so one thing is about 75% of every class session is collaborative discussion. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. me soliciting their feedback and then I turn what they say into the lecture. Excellent. Um, I actively subvert being the sage on the stage by telling them, you know, there's this educational model sage on the stage where I just talk a lot. So to subvert that, I'm going to go sit on that desk in the back. Mm -hmm. And they kind of laugh, but then they, they're always sitting like this waiting to see what's going to happen next because yeah. they don't quite know what I'm going to say. Yeah, yeah. Um, the other thing is I have inverted, I have 20% grade category and 30% grade category for either mm -hmm. final exam or participation. And it's called the introvert and extrovert track. Mm -hmm. So introverts 
can choose to talk less. They still have to talk some, but they don't feel like they have to compete with extroverts to get words out all the time. Ah, so that's they feel clever. a little bit less disenfranchised. Yeah, absolutely. But, but that works because he's already creating a sense of safety, right? Because those who feel intimidated to speak up say, oh, okay, I have options here. And I would imagine they actually talk more than they do in most classes because of that sense of safety and almost having this safety net of, right? I mean, that creates safety. Great. Those are great ideas. What else? Would you mind elaborating more on that, maybe putting it together so she can send it to us? Talking about the introvert extrovert bit? Yeah. yeah. There's track. That is a cool idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I borrowed it from a, from a friend. It wasn't mine. We don't care where you got it from. It works. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Other people, what are you already doing that would be collaborative? Yeah. So methods of um, picking a random spokesperson, yeah. like yeah. by saying, you know, whoever is closest to this, you know, birth date can speak in the group. Oh yeah. So yeah. That was one of our group. Mm -hmm. That's great. Great idea. Anybody else? Things you're already doing? We have them teach something. Good. And yeah. To get in their group and then the formal, in my class it's turned into a formal grade. Mm -hmm. And um, they have to uh, assign a specific type of cancer. Mm -hmm. They have to mm -hmm. tell the group in 15 minutes and it's a formal presentation. Yeah. No, that's a, that's a great idea. And then again, nurturing that student expert, isn't it? You prepare this, you come in, you teach your, your peers. And we all know that when you teach something, you've got to know it more intimately than you've ever known that topic um, to be able to learn to condense and teach effectively. Yeah. Anything else that you're already doing? I yeah. think we decided we would do in projects some case studies and think we're not labeling it as collaborative. <laughs> 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 so we be a little more intentional in some of these things. Yeah. Just reminding you're working in a group you're you know we're doing some collaborative things today yeah or even designating that day like i call them yeah. what a practical or application fridays yeah. why didn't i just call it focus fridays i don't know that's maybe i'll change it to that i used to do that in child development where they would have like a child development issue they had to apply the lecture from that week on but yeah i think just labeling it intentionally yeah. we do a lot of this but if we don't make it kind of have that right. structure and same with groups if we don't have our expectations labeled clearly, those things kind of fall apart. And even this little handout, I could have just said, discuss these things, right? But this makes it, and I'll even tell students, you got to turn it in. And it just makes the stakes a little higher. They take it a little more seriously and give some structure around things that we're probably already doing. So, What about ideas you have now that um, you've listened today to me, to your colleagues? What are some ideas you have? I love the, the suggestions you made about starting and then summarizing the class. Mm -hmm. I thought those were extremely helpful. Yes. Thank you, Jeff, for that, because it has made me a better teacher to do that summary and to do it well. But it doesn't always have to be a PowerPoint summary, right? I mean, we're summarizing right now, and this is a nice way to condense and consolidate uh, the material. Yeah. yeah. I really like the catch up yeah. um, <laughs> idea to just stop and compare notes and see what they grasped or what they didn't grasp and work together to try to mm -hmm. teach each other maybe a little bit. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. I yeah. For me personally, I've been teaching for a long time. <laughs> I've been teaching since 91, <laughs> but I think I get stale. Yeah. And I think these things like this, just a brief you know, hour, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. kind of gets me back in the sand. Okay, I'm, I'm still a good teacher. I Absolutely. just have kind of lost that now I need to label what I'm doing. Yeah, yeah. To be intentional. Yeah. As she and I mentioned, you got to be intentional. Absolutely. And, it, and I think we all run into that. I mean, I think of courses that I've taught for just semester after semester, and I'm just like, oh, dear, right? You know, I'm like, if, if sometimes I'll say, if they're as bored as I am, oh, dear. You know, I mean, we all have those sentiments, but how can we spice it up yeah. with just a new activity, you know, or something like that? Absolutely. And don't be afraid to take risks. Like I said, there are things that I have done in the classroom that were just like a huge flop. And I'll even joke with the students about it. I'll be like, well, look what I tried. That didn't work, you know. <laughs> but I'll turn it into a teachable moment of like, I thought this was brilliant, y'all. And clearly you did not. You know, let's talk about it so I can make this a better exercise. And that's collaboration, even informing how they're going to help students who come along to have a better exercise with that. I, I think that when I started off teaching, 
I had this sense of I've got to have all the answers. I have got to perfectly have it together. The moment I let go of that, I, I was such a better teacher and enjoyed so much more just what happens in a classroom, you know. Um, I still put pressure on myself to always deliver a great lecture, but at the same time, like, taking the risk and being willing to be vulnerable and fail has served me really well. So. Okay, Good I know, but I have yeah. times when, um, like I'll say, okay, so here's a case study and work together in your groups, and then they all just sit and they do it individually. Yeah, like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. How do you avoid that? Yeah, yeah. Well, and what I often do to avoid that is I'll give them a sheet of paper and say, everybody, choose one person to write down all your ideas because you're only turning in one paper to me, mm -hmm. um, you know, and write all your names. This is how you're getting your group work, your group grade today. Okay. Every class of mine, even if it's just kind of a nominal mention for group work, it counts as part of their grade, right? And in some classes, it's only like 5%, but they're like, I've got to get my group grade, you know? And so sometimes it's, it works, it's important. Yeah. To each other and sometimes yeah. it's just like, they're just sitting there all yeah. doing their own answers. Well, and I'm not afraid to go up to a group who's doing that and say, work together, y'all. I'm like, am I going to have to join the group here, you know, because I'm happy to, you know, and I'll just kind of do it sarcastically. Mm -hmm. But I, I think that you can, you know, encourage them to do that. And sometimes what I'll do is I'll say, okay, you can work alone for five minutes if you prefer to get your ideas down because a lot of times certain personalities do. They don't like to just feel on the spot. Get those ideas down. But then say, okay, now, it's been five minutes, now talk to each other. So just a little more structure to it can at least reaffirm that um, expectation you have for them to work and, and share together. So. What are ideas you had from talking with each other as you discussed this? Did you have anything that together helped you think through what you might want to apply? Did your partner inspire new ideas in you? Yeah, absolutely. They inspired each other to be intentional. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they did, that intentionality. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I mean, just hearing y'all's ideas has helped me think through some things I, I would like to do. I used to do this thing where I would, um, I taught uh, uh, a lifespan class. It was actually before I came to Lee, and I taught a lot of nursing students. I taught a lot of ministries. I mean, I just taught tons of students. It was a core class. So those of you who teach core classes, you can still do case studies and just have a couple different case studies. Like I, I think, for example, um, when I was teaching a lot of nursing students, I came up with some case studies. It's still psychology because I was teaching lifespan. But instead of saying, you're in a therapy room with a child, what do you do? I would say, you have an anxious parent who wants to get educated about vaccines, right? And we've just talked about all these vaccine myths and lifespan. What would you, how would you walk a parent through their fears about their kids getting vaccinated? You know, I mean, just simple little one-liners that you can adapt for a multitude of majors. I think of the big like religion core classes, right? I mean, you can think through and tell the person, say, okay, whatever your major is, how does today's lecture apply to you living out your Christian faith in a really complex world, right? You wanna be a psychologist. What did today's lecture on ethics have anything to do with what you're going to do? You know, you want to be a biologist. How did what you hear today? You know, I mean, I think just simple, even one-liners um, that don't take much effort or work on our part can make it a super meaningful, you know, experience for students. So. Thank you all for your attention. We are out of time. But if you have questions, please let me know. Um, I am happy to, my email is just hqualiana. Um, if you have questions or want me to send you more stuff, I'm, I'm happy to. Um, send you an example of a case study, all that kind of stuff. So, so yeah, thanks for coming. Thank you. Yeah.